Good morning, Spider. And good morning, world. Uh, welcome to another episode of Tandatula Sofa Safari. Uh, once more, going to be a beautiful day out here. And to ensure that we don't unwittingly bump into the River Pride and their cubs for the fourth episode in the row, I am going to be going as far away from them as possible. We're going to be heading to some new uncharted territory for Sofa Safaris, uh, out to our extreme western side of the property. Obviously, there's a chance of us seeing anything, uh, different lion prides that operate out that side, like the Vuyela pride and the giraffe pride, uh, but also some nice big water holes. So we'll have to be able to get some hippos and crocodiles and uh, just a change of scenery. So come along for the ride and let us see what today has to offer. All right, enjoy. Gonna see if uh, Dale Jackson's magic of talking about tawny eagles and then having a leopard jump out of a tree nearby works again. Um, we have had some more requests for raptors, and we are always on the lookout. You know, one of the easiest birds for us to film because of their size. Um, this is a tawny eagle, and uh, coming into winter now, for us guides that are not always expert birders, life becomes a lot easier because uh, we're now down to two or three brown eagles. In uh, summer, when we have our migratory Step eagles, the less spotted eagles, Waldberg's eagles, it can get a little bit confusing. But now if you see a brown eagle, it's going to either be this guy, the tawny eagle, a uh, juvenile battalier, or a brown snake eagle. But uh, looking quite majestic on the top of that dead uh, knob thorn is the uh, tawny eagle. And no leopards have jumped out of any trees yet. So one of the things I mentioned when we were coming here was that this area has got There goes a big tree, sorry. This is an elephant pushing down a tree not far away from here. Um, we'll go have a look there now, but uh, there's one less tree in this area. And um, one of the things I did mention when we were coming down here was that there are bigger water holes, chance of seeing crocodiles and hippos. And associated with those is this beautiful eagle that we are looking at now, the African fish eagle. Now for our viewers on the western side of the Atlantic, this might look slightly familiar. And that's because it is a very close cousin of the national bird of the USA, the bald eagle. Um, as eagles go, they probably have the best life. They spend most of the day just sitting looking glorious on a dead tree. And uh, I think it's only about 8 to 15 minutes a day do they actually do anything in terms of hunting. Um, they can subsist on two, 300 grams of fish a day. Actually, I think it's slightly more. Call it 500 grams of fish a day, but that's one fish. If they catch one fish and one effort, then that's them for the day. And they catch fish by sitting on these perches, looking for the activity of fish in the water, be it a dam, a river, anything like that. And then they'll swoop down, grab it with their talons. And once those talons hit that fish, they lock in and they will then lift up out of the water and go and eat that uh, fish in a tree. Occasionally they bite off more than they can chew and they grab a fish that is just too big for them. And um, Rather than letting it go, I also see a giraffe wandering down on our right. Uh, rather than letting it go, they will actually paddle to the shore. I've been told that it's because once their claws dig into a fish, they can't actually let it go. So it's not a case of being stubborn, but it's just a case of survival if they want to uh, get that fish away uh, or out the water with their lives intact, then they actually have to swim to the shore. Anyway, I don't know if we're going to get lucky being here to watch those eight minutes of activity today. Definitely feel that winter is pushing on, hence the added layers, the blankets and the gloves on this morning. But these small mammals are going to be feeling it too. And this becomes an increasingly common sight as we move into winter with these families of tree squirrels just hugging the west facing side of the trees in the early morning, just trying to get that first bit of warmth from the sun to warm themselves up before they go off foraging for the day dead knob thorn that's been killed by the elephants and you can see the natural holes that have formed where the termites and wood borer beetles have been digging inside and this now becomes an abode for uh, amongst many things but uh, the squirrels. I don't know if you would have actually picked up that tree going down in the audio of the video while we were sitting at the dam but uh, if I were a betting man, I would have put everything I owned on the fact that it would have been an elephant bull doing that. And that's purely because the elephant bulls are 
bigger and they are strong enough to actually push down these big trees. As a result of this, they tend to be far more destructive than the females. Um, on average, a male will destroy anywhere between five and eight trees a day, whereas a female elephant on average destroys maybe only one or two. So the effect that these elephants have on the environment tends to be far greater. And I'll maybe just ask Brit to pan around this area with her phone and you'll just see the number or the other way. <laughs> you'll see the number of uh, ring barked and dead knob fawns that are standing here. Now it's not necessarily the case only the males have killed these knob thorns. Uh, females will be very active in their uh, ring barking and destruction of trees that way but when it actually comes to physically pushing them down then it's the bulls that do most of the damage. Oh, I love wet grass. I should stop talking about trees first thing in the morning. Uh, but this one is for you, Mr. Norman Gray from KwaZulu Natal. Um, you were asking after our discussion of the marula tree in my last episode um, what the difference is between a marula and a false marula. Now, this tree on my right is a false marula. Now, to the un trained eye uh, you can be very much forgiven for thinking at first glance that this is a marula tree. Uh, the growth shape, the nature of the bark is, is also quite similar to a marula tree uh, and even the areas that they grow these false marulas also like the sandy soils like the marula trees do although there is a greater tendency to find these growing out of termite mounds than uh, marula trees themselves. Uh, doesn't quite produce the same alcoholic fruit that the marula trees do, although it does produce a fruit. This one is purple uh, during the summertime, normally in November to March. And uh, although I've never actually eaten one myself, uh, I've read that they taste a little bit like mango. The inside, the skin is, is very unpalatable. But uh, the way that you really have to look at it is by looking at the bark. Um, you'll also see how the bark is peeling off in blotches. But rather than being quite multi-layered and, and multi-colored like the uh, regular marula tree that has a lot of distinctive white blotches on it, this almost seems to be in more rectangular strip shapes than the marula tree. But the real way to differentiate them is to look at the leaves. And this is where if you want to fall asleep for the next few minutes, you are most welcome. Um, Luke the other day did discuss, I think it was with the African weeping wattle, about it being a compound leaf. Now the same applies to the marula and the false marula trees. That over there is one leaf. Um, and this over here is one leaf. These are compound leaves. Luke explained that they do this to reduce the area from which they can uh, evapotranspirate and lose moisture. Uh, but the way that trees um, get their compound leaves is one way that we can or break the, the leaves down into compound leaves and leaflets is one way that we can uh, use to identify them. Now, they both have the same shape of compound leaf, which we call an imparaphanately compound leaves. And basically, imparaphanately means that uh, you've got your main uh, rachis up here with your leaflets going off, but an imparaphanately compounded leaf will always have a terminal leaf, like this on the marula tree and like this on the false marula tree. You get something called a paraponately compounded leaf, which will have no terminal leaf, but just two leaflets on the end. Anyway, both marula and false marula are in paraponately compound leaves, which does make it a little trickier. But if we look at the difference between them, other than the, the slight color differences with the marula being a slightly more greenish color, uh, greeny blue color than the, the brighter green of the false marula, uh, the marula leaflets are all of a very similar size. And you'll see that they have quite a number of pairs of leaflets going up their compound leaf. Uh, normally between 7 and 12. Whereas, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 5 in the case of this one. This was a low down branch, you could only get the lower down ones. Whereas with your false marula tree, uh, they will typically have 2 or 3 pairs of leaflets. And their uh, terminal leaflet is a lot bigger in size than the other leaflets. Whereas with the marula, it's typically the same size or a little bit smaller. All right, you can wake up now. But that is the difference between our false marula and our real marula. False marula, real marula. False, real. Now, alcohol, false marula produces Baileys, real marula produces amarilla cream. Not true, don't believe me. Um, not as much usage or medicinal uses as a marula tree, uh, but it can also use the bark in a decoction for diarrhea. 
as well as for tanning leather. Uh, you can use the bark, it's got quite a high tannin content. Leave that to tan your leather and it gives it a nice purplish brown color. And there we go, that is your false marula. Hope you enjoyed that Norman Gray and I'll be testing you next time I see you in the bush. Sorry, my uh, conscience from the back of the vehicle reminded me of the other big difference um, between the marula and the false marula, which is what we were kind of looking at when trying to confirm the actual tree. And that is on these leaflets. Uh, you'll notice that on the false marula leaflet, uh, the leaflets grow straight off the main vein or the, the, the rachis. Whereas on our marula trees, all the leaflets have a, what we'll call a petiolule, but a little stalk growing off that main uh, vein, the main rachis. So that is the easiest way can listen to all the other things I said, but this is the easiest way to actually identify them. There we go. Now I can throw them away and hopefully not have to go look for them again. Boom. It's not a common thing, but not unknown, uh, but it's just to find these swads of grass growing out of trees and I would have imagined that it would be a pretty rubbish hot dog grass growing out of a tree but this is a proper steak grass it looks uh, like it's buffalo or guinea grass growing out of this uh, knob thorn now what has likely happened is that there's going to be a natural hole in the tree and um, animals have been nesting in there so there's going to be droppings there's going to be nesting material which is going to provide the organic matter um, and possibly over time even a little bit of sand maybe from termite activity that has provided a substrate that this grass can grow in grass seeds have ended up there possibly taken in by squirrels or birds something like that and with the rain falling it has decided to grow and it's growing very very well the fact that it probably doesn't get grazed by anything i've never seen a zebra climb a tree to eat grass means that it's probably going to keep on growing for a while but there we go some uh, guinea grass growing out of a knob thorn A pepper pan. I heard it's where an impala once got assaulted. This area in general is quite green compared to the main part where we've been doing our surface safaris. We are at the moment for about 15 kilometers to the west of uh, Tandatula Safari Camp and uh, even though it's not very far that difference can sometimes result, or that uh, distance can result in uh, quite different rainfall. And the late rains that have fallen this summer haven't really hit us in the central part of the Timbervati, but they've been more concentrated out in these western sectors. And you can see that, and sorry, anyway, this water that is green now from the algae is as a result of the rain that fell last week. Um, what happens is that the majority of the drops of rain actually have algal spores in them, and they fall into the ground uh, wash into these pans along with a whole lot of organic matter and this just provides the nutrition needed for these algal blooms to take place. Um, what has happened is that the wind has blown from our southeast and uh, concentrated all of the water here on the north uh, all of the algae here on the northwestern side that's why it's so concentrated but it's not bad water this is just a natural process it tends to happen in, in smaller bodies of water where there's not so much movement you get movement you get it stirred up and uh, it tends not to bloom as much but in the smaller pans like this it will sit there animals are not going to be affected by it. it might alter the taste of the water but animals aren't very fussy when it comes to drinking algal infested waters uh, what it will have a negative impact on is some of the aquatic organisms because what happens is when algae dies or algae i haven't quite figured that one out yet when it dies it starts breaking down um, and in that uh, decomposition process a lot of the oxygen from the water is actually used so in the smaller pans of water you can get a deficiency of oxygen in it which would obviously affect your fish and other aquatic invertebrates but there we go algae LG. algae algae is a type of tv brand isn't it so i'll call it algae
just been driving through beautiful Knobthorne woodland, but as soon as we get out into a more open patch, we have our impalas and a little sound of warthogs gathered. Just commenting, oh, there they go, on how big that uh, sow was standing next to an impala. She's like two thirds of her size, maybe half. Maybe I'm exaggerating for effect there, but a uh, very red color uh, of those warthogs due to the um, mud walling that they've been doing here in some. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, due to the uh, mud walling that they have been doing in uh, redder, more iron oxide rich soils. How's my nose looking? You'll uh, notice that very often when we show you young male giraffes together, they're doing exactly the same thing. It is practicing their necking. These two haven't chosen the best spot. They kind of balanced on islands surrounded by eroded gullies. So a greater chance of losing your footing, but uh, in a way I guess it also keeps the opponent firmly planted where he is. Streaker running onto the scene. Wanting to get in on the action and not be left alone. But you will note that uh, third run as it joins the party is that it is a shade or two lighter in colour than the other two, yet of a similar age. A lot of theories about why giraffes change in colour and, and how different factors affect how light or dark they are. Although it is, I do believe, age-related, that all the ones do tend to be dark, there's also some other factors at play, one of which is potentially from new studies related to testosterone levels, that um, darker giraffes are more attractive to females than lighter giraffes, and if you've got a nice dark coat, it's because you've got high levels of testosterone and you're showing off to those females uh, that you are a better male. This works in lines with males that have darker manes being more attractive to females than the blonder maned one. Um, but it is uh, potentially also just a genetic thing uh, because even in an area like this you see a lot of variation between giraffes from light, very light to very, very dark, sometimes almost black. Tag team wrestling. Oh, the guy tapped out and now his mates come to fight. I don't know whether the one that's wandered off just used that as an excuse to get out of the fight and the playing because he doesn't look that interested. You know, you can't do this all day. You have got to feed, especially when you're an animal the size of a giraffe. Uh, but it could also have been a much more subtle hierarchical displacement there. Uh, again, probably quite familiar with who is who in the zoo. And perhaps seeing another giraffe coming in and knowing that he's maybe loses out in fights to this one or the, the, the pale one has a greater strength than the one that walked away, may have just opted to back away from the situation. Now, can actually see a fourth male wandering into the scene so we'll see what happens if he ever makes it yet oh it actually looks like it could be a female as promised we have found some crocodiles um, we are at the very western border of the Timbabati now and uh, a couple hundred meters behind me is the Kisiri river which is a semi-perennial I guess it makes it a non-perennial river but it does actually have water for much longer in the year than any of our other river courses and as a result does support crocodiles but what has happened is from that permanent river these crocodiles have or oh sorry semi-permanent semi river these crocodiles have dispersed and settled in much more permanent dams so they are the Nile crocodile a species that is found throughout Africa and um, they are renowned for being uh, pretty large actually the third largest reptile in the world after the leatherback turtles and the saltwater crocodiles. Although they don't quite attain the length of the saltwater crocs, they have a, a reputation that is, is comparable. Um, they have got the ability to get to just over six meters in length, although the average for a, a fully grown crocodile in the Kruger is probably closer to three and a half to four meters. Uh, these ones, based on the small environment in which they live, are not going to be getting as much food, so they are going to tend to grow slower. In the more permanent rivers where there's a great supply of fish and potentially even larger mammals crocodiles are going to acquire more food and they are going to tend to get larger sizes if you go to somewhere like Ma the mara river in east africa in the Mara serengeti 
systems uh, where the crocodiles are munching on wildebeest and zebra every time they run through the river. Uh, you, you are getting monsters there. They regularly reach five and a half to six meters. But um, yeah, don't let their size fool you. As humans, we can generally regard any crocodile over two meters in length as being dangerous to human health. So be careful when you are around these waters. But they live pretty lazy lives. Um, so as ectothermic animals, um, they don't produce their own internal body heat like we do, uh, which means that they don't need to eat as frequently. They're not spending as much energy as a human is maintaining their body temperature. Uh, they maintain it by doing what these crocodiles have been doing, basking on the banks on islands, opening their mouths when they get too hot to try and cool down, um, and going into the water as well if it gets too warm. But uh, they can afford to go for long periods of time without eating. The big crocodiles in the Mara River again might only eat once every year uh, during the migration, um, but they absolutely gorge themselves. Small ones like this are going to eat more regularly, maybe a couple of times a week or every few weeks, depending on what they get. But their diet is going to be made up of the much smaller things frogs, insects when they're younger, and uh, fishes. Uh, this one, possibly able to take a small antelope, but. Um, He's gone now, so I can't even be sure if that is the truth or not. We could wait here until next year to see if he eats, or we could uh, start making our way home. It's up to you, Brit. Do you need to eat? There's a nod and a crocodile grin. So we're going to slowly be making our way back, but I'm glad at least we got the croc. The last dam had a hippo, but he was being as uncooperative as these crocodiles are being. So um, we'll find more hippos for you at some point during our safer safari season. We're going to carry on for now. A rare moment of peace in the Impala world at the moment. We have our full moon on the 7th of May, which would be the peak of their rutting. These male hormones are still pumping through. Um, but yeah, tranquil afternoon. Uh, and yes, we did set out in the morning down to the far western sector, but we just decided to carry on a little bit this afternoon, see if we can add a little bit more content to this episode. I don't often see the impalas out on the riverbeds. It's obviously nice and open for them, but with their relatively small hooves, um, they sink into the sand, and it would make running a little bit more difficult um, getting away from predators. So they prefer a slightly harder substrate, but uh, I guess the fact that they are so open and that there is the advantage of greenery on the riverbanks is what has drawn them in here this afternoon. Amongst all the unpleasant calls of pilot breasted rollers, we do have a much more pleasant sounding bird uh, called, shht, called the double banded sand grouse. It's a pair, they're a male and a female. Uh, the male is the one that has got the black and white bands above the beak. And um, they've got a beautiful call, but we typically only hear them either first thing in the morning or most typically uh, last thing in the evening when they head to water to drink, um, maybe about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes after sunset. If you sit at any water hole, you just get this beautiful cho chorus of the uh, double-banded sand grouse calling. Doesn't sound like that. And what these sand grouse are most famous for are um, the males that will, especially in the desert areas, things like your yellow-throated and your the Macqua sand grouse, I think that's a bird. <laughs> but where they nest very far from water, the males have um, the duty of taking water to the chicks. So what they'll do is they'll fly many kilometers to a water point and then go and submerge themselves in the water and the feathers act like a sponge on the chest and they will actually absorb this water and then fly all the way back to the nest and let the chicks um, drink water out of those feathers that have absorbed the water or just sit on the eggs to keep them cool. But uh, I, mean, I think it was one of the BBC Planet Earth uh, episodes, or maybe BBC Africa, but they showed these uh, sand grouse in the Kalahari doing this. And if memory serves correct, they're flying something like 30 kilometers to and from their nest to the water. Incredible dedication. I'm gonna try my imitation again. It goes a little something like, It's so good, even they've started calling.
probably can't even tell the difference between me doing it and the birds. So I didn't break a promise. I did tell you that we wouldn't show you the River Pride Cubs this episode and uh, not through lack of trying because they're hiding in our camp in the thickets behind us munching on a kill. So they are here. You can probably hear them, which is not the same as seeing them. Um, but <laughs> not sure what it is. Found them this morning. They dragged their kill, probably a Nyala in here. And you can hear the growls as the cubs are playing and trying to get the last scraps from mom. But they've literally spent the entire day in this thicket. I'm sure they will emerge a little later. But we are going to call it uh, quits for today. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Tundatula Soap Safari. But before we do head off, um, just a request from Sue Twos from England, uh, just to give a shout out to all of those uh, health professionals, healthcare professionals, and people just working on the front line of the fight against this COVID pandemic. Um, we thank you for all of the work that you're putting into. I know it's often a thankless task. But uh, just know that your efforts are appreciated. But I uh, hope you have enjoyed this episode. And be sure to tune in again very soon for another one coming out at, on Sunday. So, uh, no, this one is on Sunday. So, Wednesday, check again. Until then, take care. Cheers. in the background. So yeah, it's just uh, Nweti, near Leti's daughter. We've got the remains of a kill, very scant remains of a kill up here, but um, the hyenas have been giving me grief and that's why she's kind of moved away for now. In all my driving around thinking which leopards we have and which ones are beautiful, she crossed my mind as being the most beautiful we have here. And I think that will be difficult to dispute at the moment. Her belly is looking quite full and her eyes are closing, which is quite the opposite of me. My belly is quite empty. And uh, I'm hoping to, hoping, <laughs> hoping, hoping to open a beer. I promise I haven't done one yet. So we're going to leave her be. And uh, hopefully this will not be the last time we catch up with her. Thank you, Nweti.